I got it. Yep. Um, we see. Yeah, oh. we see. You see. Okay, perfect. Yep. And then you can make it yep. uh, as much as you, you know, as small or bigger you want. Yeah. Okay. Looks good, Jane. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. So, um, you know, I just wanted to, uh, um, again, thank Jane. Uh, today she's going to be talking about New World, or, or we call it New World, but it's it's pretty <laughs> pretty ancient, and she'll touch on so prior to um, Columbus and American Despucho um, basically coming into the New World. You know what was the life you know like, and uh, basically she'll touch on the interesting mystic uh, figurines, and there's going to be mo many more stuff. And, and uh, I mean, I, I digress. I, I don't pretend to know as much as Jane. She had, I believe Jane had lived and um and understand uh the Hello our powerful women presentation. But um uh today we are taking a little bit of break. Okay. Hello? I can hear you, Jane. Okay, well, that's all that happens. Jack, do you want me to start talking? Okay. Yeah, I lost, Zach. I lost Zach for a minute there. I don't know if he's plugged in or not. I, I Can you hear me now? I can hear you, Jane. Okay, well, then I might as well start, okay? Yep. All right. So welcome to my chat about transoceanic contact in the ancient world. And I usually uh, discuss powerful women who were in the British phrase, no better than they should be. But I decided to take a rest and talk about a much less complicated topic. It's certainly a disputed topic. So I hope this will be a discussion rather than a lecture. I'll talk for a while and then we'll have breaks and Please raise your hand to speak and Patty, you'll call on them. If something occurs to you in between, put it in the chat. Patty, are you still here? I'm here. And um, so let me make make clear. Do you want me, you don't want to take questions while you're presenting, do you? Uh, no, I don't. But if there are a few, you know, wait for about three or four and then yell at me to have a break. Okay. All right. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. I'm gonna go on mute now so as not to disturb you. Okay. Um, I, well, how did this start? I was in one of the early grades of primary school about a million years ago, and the teacher put a map up on the board. It was one of those rectangular things with a very muscular Northern hemisphere and a kind of dwindling away Southern one. Like probably 90% of all the kids in the room, the rest being asleep, I fancied that the continents would fit together very nicely, like a jigsaw puzzle. But of course, being me, I said so out loud, was brutally made fun of by the teacher and traumatized for life. So of course, I never, I promised myself I would never open my mouth again about a controversial topic. Okay, and now we have a slide that is of Brendan the Navigator. Uh, this is an Irish legend that he island hopped across the Atlantic, but one of his landings was not on an island, but a giant fish named Jixconius. That's just for fun. And now let's get serious. Before we start, let's dispense with the idea that oceans can't be crossed without modern technology. People, even teenagers, happily sail little boats across oceans and row across them all the time. Of course, the race rower is highly technical and has a water pump, which has been known to fail, and a way that the cabin can be sealed in time of uh, storms. And there's a tender boat that knows where the rowers are. But still, the motive power is the human arm extended by an oar. Just yesterday, there was an article in the Times about a man who was rescued 
with his dog after nearly three months afloat and lost in the Pacific. As for the Atlantic, two courageous Norwegian fishermen, Harbaugh and Samuelson, did row across the Atlantic to France in the early 20th century. There's even a song about them, which I won't play. I'll talk about one possible contact via each of the big oceans, although there are many possibilities. My postulated transatlantic contact will be that of Nubia, and now the Sudan, and the Olmec region of Gulf Coast, Mexico. And on the other side, I'll explore possible trans-Pacific contact between Asia and the Mexican West Coast. I'll review some of the quote and evidence, unquote, that has been cited to support these contacts. I really don't expect to convince anyone that's not the point, but only to introduce what St. Bernard called the worm of doubt regarding single ice age, post ice age migration very via the Bering Straits. The other side, I like to call them the dark side, dismisses such evidence if such it is, and says that culture evolves in pretty much the same way throughout the world. At a certain point of development, you get pyramids like acne. And here we have some pyramids. Okay, this guy, this pyramid is the pyramid of Joseph. And this is early kingdom, uh, old kingdom from Egypt and is in the third millennia BCE. And I was just there um, a couple of months ago and it, there it is. I think this is a little bit cleaned up. On this side, we have Nubian pyramids. I should mention, shall I admit Michael Sater? I think I just admitted him, Jane. I'm, I, oh, I'm okay. taking care of that part, so you can just- Okay, because it's, it's on my screen, that's why. Oh. Uh, and, uh, you know, the relation between Egypt and Nubia was very complicated. Um, the Nubians were slaves to the Egyptians. Sometimes they conquered the Egyptians. They intermarried with the Egyptians. As far as technology is concerned, if Egypt had it, Nubia had it. And the you can see here pylons, just as if you go to Luxor, you'll see the pylons before the pyramids. The pyramids do have a slightly different shape. Over here, we have a typical Maya pyramid. And over here, one of the Olmec pyramids that um, is the civilization that I'm about to talk about. Before I start, let me make clear that I believe if left to their own devices, the people of the new world, just like their cousins in the old world, were perfectly smart enough to develop the goodies of civilization without any help. But new world civilizations could have been influenced by old world contacts at various times and in various places. It doesn't take an invasion by hordes from another civilization to change history. We don't need what became the Greeks to enter the peninsula. Um, we don't need the Incas to wipe out the previous and I think somewhat more advanced civilizations in that region, a single human being can do it. Think of the missionaries like St. Patrick. Think of Xuanzang who brought the Buddhist scriptures to China. Now you can say, oh, these are ideas, you know, how much do they count? Well, if you look at temples that were before and then you look at Christian churches, you will see that a culture, a whole way of looking at things, the whole way of building, the whole way of depicting uh, the object of your devotion has changed. Now, as far as the Olmecs are concerned, I'll start with them because they have what for me is the most spectacular of the New World cultural artifacts and the most hotly debated, the Olmec heads. Wow. 
Where am I all my kids? Well, we might as well talk about where they came from. The Olmec sites are the ones obviously in yellow, Tres Zapotes, La Venta, and San Lorenzo. And uh, this is the Gulf of Mexico, so you now, now have an idea of where they were. They're the heads. The average weight of one of these is eight tons. The largest completed one is 25 tons. They are made of basalt, which was quarried about 40 miles away in the Sierra de Tuxlas and transported to the sites of San Lorenzo, Tres Zapotes, and La Venta on the Gulf Coast of what is now Mexico. The Olmec heartland is tropical forest and marsh, let's say swamp. They actually had to build their settlements um, on mounds cut by many rivers. The formation from which the basalt was taken to form the head can only be dated geologically, which isn't really much help because that gets measured in units of like 10,000 years. Ceramics can be uh, dated with some accuracy to when they were fired, but stone can't be dated this way, at least I don't know. And I don't think anyone else does. However, some heads were buried. There are a couple more heads. I'll let you look at them for a couple of minutes. The one on the right is partially buried. And there's the excavation, which has revealed one of them. And the stratigraphy of the earth around that, the layers, gives an estimate of their burial date, about 900 BCE, one case. But they could have been made at any time previous to that. The beginning of the Olmec civilization was in 1500 BCE, but there's nothing to say they weren't made by pre-Olmecs and buried by Olmecs who craved a change of decor. The miracle of the heads, at least for me, is not that they were quarried and carved and transported from the formation to the site in which they were found, because I'll get into the mechanics of that in a bit. It's that they are three-dimensional representation of human beings so realistic and individual that you would recognize the originals if you met them on the street. Where among ancient civilizations can we find such a skill and such a people? The Greeks developed it, as you all know, but much later, we're talking, what, fourth century BC, fifth century, maybe. There is a head of Gudea, a ruler, or Legal of Sumer, which might show what he actually looked like. Or it might be one of a series of rulers, all of whom looked alike in the representation. Anyhow, the Sumerians died out a couple of hundred years before the Olmec civilization began. And passing ahead, ah, there we have the pharaohs, Ramses II, Amenhotep III, and Hatshepsut. During the New Kingdom, which began in 1550 BCE, the representation of pharaohs were so stylized that they could be reused by their successors who scratched out the old name and put theirs on. And Shepsut was female, as you know. Pharaoh statues were supposed to have certain characteristics and that didn't leave much room for reality. Akhenaten is the exception. He lived from 1380 to 1396 near the beginning of the Olmec, or he was reigned from 1380 to 1386, near the beginning of the Olmec civilization. But as you see, the work is pretty crude compared to the heads. The most realistic statues the Egyptians have left us are those of their scribes and nobles. Slide 10, this is this famous seated scribe. And he was made in Saqqara at 2600 BCE and from the reign of Ramses II later on, 
we have the scribe Rames, who is male, by the way. The contrast between these is obvious. The Egyptians seem to have lost the gift evident in the seated scribe, at least in public works, for the next thousand years, when individual artists may have kept the ability to do work like that alive. The seated scribe doesn't look like the Olmec heads. He has high cheekbones, they don't. They have flat noses and they have full lips. If you ask anyone in the street where people who have heads like the Olmecs are found, they will answer Central Africa. They are indubitably black. A lot of trouble was gone to the Olmecs in obtaining black basalt for the statues. There's plenty of limestone in the Olmec area. In fact, the most common statue associated with their religion depicts somebody carrying an infant out of a cave. And most caves are made out of limestone, a few out of marble, a few out of um, our volcanic our caves. And the Maya actually use limestone for their stele, but limestone isn't black. Basalt is actually a lot harder than limestone. Any old rock will cut limestone but basalt requires jade or obsidian tools. Some of the heads are not black. There's the sculpted heads. They're still basalt, but weathering has oxidized the iron mixed in to the mix when they were formed. The heads might have been painted just like the seated scribe. And now we get to Pia. Let's look at Nubia. In 746 BCE, Pia, king of Kush, counted Egypt, conquered Egypt, and this is a Nubian statue of Pia. Of course, there were people who looked like him before, but they weren't eminent enough to have left statues of themselves. If you go to Sudan today, you won't see faces like this or those of the Almec heads. Ancient Egypt and Nubia intermixed in many ways. And what was more, intermarriage was common. In Islam came to North Africa, 642 CE, and there was a caliphate in Egypt, all of which further amplified the genetic pool. Here is a head found in Turkey, but designated a Nubian from the second century BCE. It for sure doesn't look Turkish. This is what ancient Nubians look like. At this point, somebody always brings up genetic studies. Mitochondrial or maternal DNA is passed on only by the female. And it apparently hasn't changed from corpses dug up during the old Macaulay day to the present. There are two ways to answer this. The first one is statistical. The old Mac heartland, as I said, is a swamp. Bodies don't do well in swamps. They do well in deserts. And they don't do well in swamps unless they have pretty fancy tombs. And only elites get fancy tombs. The number of bodies investigated in this area has been vanishingly small. A couple of years ago, the, the number was two. The genetics of elites may well be different from the general population. Think Egyptian pharaohs who married their sisters as a rule, and the last edition of them were Greek. And elites have improved chances of survival even after death. There's probably a large percentage, like 99.9% .9 of the ancient Alnic population that left no DNA or anything else of them for posterity to find. The second argument is based on human nature. I have personal experience with the female half of that. If someone set out, as I've been implying, from the mouth of the Nile and ended up in Mexico, it was either by accident or on purpose, or started on purpose, but continued by accident. In any case, the chance of a woman on board a boat meant to go fishing commercially or trading would be small to none. If the voyage were intended to be an exploration, the odds are even worse. If by some strange chance a female or two, like me, was on the passenger list, 
we would either have jumped overboard, preferring suicide by shark to another day at sea, or been eaten by our fellow crew members well before the boat touched shore. These guys, supposing they look like their statue and were, of course, suitably ripped from all that rowing and so forth, they would have no trouble finding companionship wherever they made landfall, and none of their offspring would have a shred of maternal DNA from their native area. I think this is a good time to have a break and maybe talk with people. Hello? Yeah, um, so far we only have um, one contribution. Bev had mentioned that she many years ago went to an Olmec exhibition at Princeton University and thought it was magnificent. Uh -huh. um, but I they don't know. They can talk further about that. What did they see? Um, Bev, did you want to comment any further? Would you like to be unmuted? Mm, not getting any response. And I don't see, let me just double check, but I don't see any hands raised. Well, I'm waiting to see if Bev wants to chat with us further, but um, no, I don't see any hands raised. Okay. So, Bev, do you want to drop a note into the chat if you want me to unmute you? I think we're all set, um, Jane. We okay. can we can proceed. I'll let you know if anybody lets me know. Uh -huh. I just want to pour myself. So yeah, if, if anybody does have um, catch something that they would like to talk more about or um, would like to share their own experiences, um, you can either raise your hand or drop a note in the chat. And uh, when Jane pauses, we can give you a chance to ask your questions, or if you'd rather not do that, I can read them for you. Thanks. Okay. Then I'll continue. The Almec had two forms of writing. Epi Almec, which has been recently and brilliantly deciphered by John Justinson, and it is thought to be the predecessor of the far more advanced Maya system but is much too late to be relevant to the Olmecs. More relevant and more from a more appropriate date, thought to be 900 BCE, which date seems to keep coming up, is the system on the Cascajal block. It is the earliest writing in Mesoamerica. So let's take a look at it. And on the left, you can see the Cascajal block. And on the right, you can see uh, the Epi Almec, along with the cute picture. Now, to me, this looks like a mixture of ice cream cones and uh, grenades and pineapples and a bug. Where's my bug? There's a bug here. Yes, that's a bug. But it meant enough to someone to carve it in stone and to expect it to convey something to other people. If writing had been brought from Egypt at any time during the Olmec period, it certainly wouldn't look like that. The idea of writing, though, can be transmitted by even an illiterate person. The Egyptian system uses logograms, which are pictures that mean what they look like, but it's also a syllabic system with pictures that mean a syllable like ka and ki and ta and to and so forth. And there are also determinants, which are pictures that tell you what another picture refers to. Is the picture that you're going to see, is it a god? Is it a human activity like running? Um, anything. The number of pictures in a pure syllabic system is equal to the number of vowels times the number of consonants. It's pretty easy to invent one of your own if you and a correspondent speak the same language. And kids can be taught to do it so they can communicate with their sibs. Um, of course, what we see when we look up a syllabary is usually a table 
with vowels across the top and consonants down the side and the pictures in the boxes. Of course, you can't do that if you don't have an alphabet, but you could still have your pictures. And it really, it, if English were one of the languages that have five vowels, like um, Spanish, and also I think Maya is close to it. We have a zillion vowels. If you start counting every which way we pronounce our vowels, uh, a, a, uh, and a, uh, a, uh, uh, and a, and e, and e, uh, and so forth. Um, and then, you know, the diphthongs and all that. But this language may not have had that. And so what you're left with, and don't forget our consonants kind of collapse too, because uh, a C can be C like cat, or it can be C like cease. And in a syllabary, both of these would collapse into it. Um, C would collapse into S, and C, the other C would collapse into K. I hope you follow all that. But um, you're left with about a hundred pictures, which sound like what they depict. And that really isn't hard to memorize. I mean, think of what Chinese kids have to learn. Now, here's how a Maya syllabary works. And you see, ka, sa, and ya. Now, the idea of something like this could easily travel from Egypt. In fact, if you've ever been to Egypt on a tour or on your own and gone into one of the souvenir stands, uh, you will see, they will offer to make a, um, a cartouche. The pharaoh's name was always um, designated by an oval around it, and that was called the cartouche, and it was written syllabically, um, o, tep. And they will do one for your name. So if it were Bernard, they would get Ber and Nar word. And they can do this and you can wear this at home and you can wear it many years afterwards. And the idea, as I said, of a syllabary is very simple and can be carried by people who are semi-illiterate. Now here, I think I have a cartouche for you. Yeah, there's a cartouche. And there's how it's read, over here. And those are the rec requisite pictures. Now, the Olmecs had like the Maya, a bar dot number system. Bars were one and dots were, um, I think five. And it had a base 20. And the Egyptian system was base 10. Uh, nobody coming from elsewhere would need to share or impose their number system if the pl place already had their own. Making people change their number system would probably screw up trade and um, cause a revolution. In fact, people without the wheel or writing system have moved very heavy things all over the world. Um, if you go to Egypt or some other countries, one of the pestilential guides succeeds in attaching himself like a tick to you. You will no doubt hear a can spiel about how nobody knows how the pyramids were built, how they moved such heavy blocks, etc. Uh -huh. People just did it. All you need to do is know how, and that can be transmitted by a single individual. Charles Payne describes how the Egyptians moved 700 tons of obelisk from Aswan to Thebes around 1500 BC. The barges are shown in bas relief on Hatshepsut's temple at Dir el Bari. The obelisks were moved on rollers to the water's edge and a canal was dug beneath them. Let's see if we have it, yes. Leaving them supported at prow and stern. The barges were loaded with twice the weight of the obelisk. And as Pliny the Elder wrote, the ships were able to come beneath the obelisk 
which was suspended by its ends from both banks of the canal. Then the blocks were unloaded and the ships riding high took the weight of the obelisks. People can move heavy stuff when there are enough of them. Here is Tor Heyerdahl's description of how 12 men from Easter Island without tools or other, other than sticks and stones, moved a, a moai and set it upright. Heyerdahl had bribed the mayor with $100 for the demonstration. The statue was 10 feet tall and weighed probably 30 tons. The figure had its face buried deep in the earth, but the men got their tips of the poles underneath it. And while three or four men hung and pulled at the furthest end of each pole, the mayor lay flat on his stomach and pushed small stones under the large face. As the hours passed, the stones became larger and larger. When evening came, the giant's head had been lifted three feet from the ground while the space beneath was packed with stones. The next day, one of the poles was discarded. Five men assembled at each of the others. The mayor stood on the ahu, or stone platform, wall with arms outstretched, beating the air in time as he shouted to the men. That day they pushed both poles under the right side of the giant. He tilted imperceptibly, but the imperceptible became millimeters and millimeters became inches, which became feet. Then the poles were moved to the left side. They continued for this way for about a week. On the ninth day, the figure lay stretched on its stomach on top of an elaborately built tower the highest side of which was nearly 12 feet above the slope. The men dangled from ropes made fast to the ends of the poles. When the statue lay at its highest point, the men began to jerk it feet forward in the direction of the ahu on which it was to stand. They continued to add stones under the giant's head to slant the statue as before. And after a magic ritual was conducted by one of the tribe's elder women, the statue was slowly lowered to stand upright on its platform. Heyerdahl then watched the whole village cooperate in moving one of these statues along the ground, using only their arms and two ropes while laughing and cheering at the festivity. He asked the mayor why he never told anybody how it was done. The mayor said that nobody had ever asked. By the way, did I, men I did mention pyramids. Joseph's pyramid predates the Olmecs by a thousand years and Maya pyramids are way after the Olmecs died out. But if you're coming up the Nile from Nubia, you have to pass Sakala, not to mention Giza. And the idea of a pyramid is easy to take with you. And this is an Egyptian boat. And of course it had sailed, or there would have been a big pile of them at the first cataract. I don't know what was done to negotiate the cataracts, which are areas of rapids in the Nile. Portages, probably. The solar boat was actually carried by the temple personnel during festivals. There might have been relays. And here we have, aha, Nubian captives on a boat. They're being ferried, presumably downstream, to Egypt. Ah, we have four people in the chat. Can we hear them? Hello? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, Beverly and I were just chatting back and forth. Uh, oh, she, okay. She said that she had seen the exhibit so long ago that she really didn't um, remember it so much, but that the enormous sculpted heads were unforgettable. And let's see, a new message just showed up. Oh, Bev says she can speak. So let me unmute her. If it's yeah. a good time for you? Yeah, why not? Uh, hold on, I'm trying to ask to unmute. Did you get the message, Bev, that I... Um... Yes. Okay, <laughs> there you are. Hi. <laughs> hey. So, Hi, um, Beth. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jane. Hi. Uh, so interesting. Uh, just recently, I did a presentation uh on the phoenicians oh maybe less than a month ago or about a month ago and none of this is surprising having uh research the phoenicians 
whose entire lives were essentially on water. And they were greatly influenced by the Egyptians. Uh And of course, um, what do we do when we admire uh, uh, anything is we uh, either um, imitate or we create on our own that which influenced us. And, and so uh, the Phoenicians also were engaged in slavery. Uh, so it's not at all surprising that Nubians, which, was, uh, which is so close to Egypt, uh, wound up in uh, Central America. Yes. It could easily have been. Thank you, Beth. As I yes. said, I'm not trying to be comprehensive here. I'm just trying to like open and, people's minds to the idea now, that something could have happened. Right. So it, it really, if, um, and I would have never known had I not uh, done the research, how in the world would Africans wind up uh so many years ago, I mean in prehistory BC, uh wind up uh in the Olmec culture. So the Phoenicians uh set up trading posts along uh their route and and so with their their trading, including slaves. Um, it, it just allowed for uh, the people of every single culture uh, in prehistory to have had contact. Um, yes. Just that's my point. Thank you. Yes. Sure. Okay. Well, here we have these Nubian guys. Now, um, they seem to have the best seats in the house. And I think if you look really close, um, they look as if they're tied up or something. But um, that, that may be an artistic um, thing. I mean, if they were being transported as slaves, they were probably in the hold, but then you wouldn't know if they were on the boat. So they had to be put where you could see them. And they're being ferried downstream to Egypt. Um, they may have had a high rank. Um, and well, for my purposes, a very useful slide. What if these prisoners got themselves free, took over the boat and managed to get into the Mediterranean? It used to be believed that the Egyptians were river and coastal sailors only, but only recently studies have found their trade goods all over, particularly in Crete. And you can't get to Crete without crossing open water and a lot of it. Once you're in the Mediterranean, you can hug the coast until you get to the Straits of Gibraltar. And if you go through, because you don't know what's on the other side, or you got drunk, you find you pitched a ride on the Canary Current, which joins the North Equatorial Current. And if you stay left, you'll end up in the Caribbean Current, which delivers you to the Gulf of Mexico. And there we are. And you can trace this. See the Gulf of Mexico off the Caribbean Current? has its very own current and goes exactly where we'd like them, like it to. Of course, these ex-prisoners wouldn't know anything about these currents or maybe anything about boats, so they'd more or less go with the flow. They'd have to. It turns out that it rains a lot in the latitudes in questions, and the boat was probably contain- equipped with containers in the little cabin area they're pictured sitting on. As the beer, which would be, have been the original thing in the containers, ran out, the containers could be filled with rainwater. While it lasts, beer is nutritious. The Atlantic is full of fish and also sargassum weed, as you well know if you've gone to Cancun recently. The belt can be up to 1,500 miles wide, and it's edible if you're desperate. Okay, that's all fantasy, but I defy anyone to prove that it couldn't happen. For some reason, 
most theories on transoceanic uh, contact involve Asia, never Africa. Partly because there were convenient islands along the way in the Pacific, partly because the Polynesians had catamaran boats, that's boats that are on two um, float things that are on the side on the bottom, that were at home on the open ocean, and partly because of a hangover from colonial era racial stereotyping. One of the earliest sites towards the west coast of Mexico, but not on the coast quite, is Xochipala. And let's get the map. Oh, have I given, I've given the wrong map. Oh no, here it is, over there. Actually, there was a lot of um, going back and forth. I think it's a Chalcatzingo where there was a cave with a prophetess who used to get high on the uh, um, exhalations from the caves, the fumes, and give prophets that way. But I won't go into that now, just to mention it. And I think they were equally used by both sides. The area produced exquisite figurines, several inches tall. Some have been dated controversial to 1300 BC, but are probably made anywhere in the interval between 1500 and 200 BCE, which is a pretty wide net. And there you see them. The, the two on the left are from the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I always go to say hello to them. And we can, let me give you a minute to look at them. Yeah, the one on the right is another one of my friends from Matt. The one on the left, well, it might look a little Asian. Um, that actually doesn't mean much, although it might. I don't know how much genealogy and, and DNA analysis has happened, but a lot of Latin American guys are nicknamed Chino because that's the way they look. Um, if we look for an Asian source of pottery figures with a comparable degree of individuation and technical expertise, we don't have much trouble finding them. Of course, the scale is a little different. And these are the terracotta warriors, each with a face of their very own, of Qin Shi Huangdi, the first emperor of China who died in 210 BCE. I should mention the Greeks could also do that and considerably earlier. And here we have our pottery face. They were also sailors, and this is from the Delphi Museum. Another civilization that briefly flowered in our hemisphere was the Nairi, located more or less on the Pacific coast of Mexico from 100 to 250 CE. Not much is known about them, but grave goods have made their way into the private market and now in museums, including the Met and the Chicago Art Institute. Here are two slides, each of which has a Han Dynasty, 200 BC to 200 CE house and a Nairid house. Here's the first. And here is the second. In each case, the Nayarit house is on the left. Needless to say, wooden roofs, high peaked roofs and houses of more than a single story were not common in Mexico at this time, if they existed at all. This is the usual model of the, that you will see, at least this is what I saw when I was helping out with some archeology span um, in Yucatan. And I think it is present to this day. The thatch up there may look charming, but it's full of insects and they drop on you, believe me. <laughs> My next example is from literature and botany. The literature is the Maya creation epic called the Popo Wu, the story of the people. And the botany is a plant I encountered in Thailand. The heroes of the Popo Vu are two sets of twins. The first, one Unapu and seven Unapu, 
the numbers have to do with the date of their birth, are invited by the demons to come to Shibalba, the underworld, to play the famous ball game. And you see the ball courts all over in the Maya areas. They agree, but on the way down, they fall for every trick the demons play on them. The demons cheat at the ball game and the twins are defeated. One Unapu's head is hung in the Seba tree, which has fruits that look like heads and here's the Seba. Blood moon, they're pretty, they're big. Believe me, they're, they're big. They're probably about a foot and a half. Blood moon, the daughter of the most prominent demon, is wandering in the forest when Unapu's head calls to her and promises that if she puts her hand out, he will feel, fill it with sweets. She does, and the head spits in her hand, and that makes her pregnant. When she begins to show, her father refuses to believe her story and asks his owls to take her to the woods and kill her and bring back her heart to eat. Maya literature is pretty brutal. But the owls take pity on her because, you know, she's really innocent. She shows them a plant whose leaves are green, but when it's crushed, looks like bloody flesh. The owls let her escape and take this fake heart back to her father who goes blind from the smoke when he cooks it. When I was in Thailand, the guide for our trek, this is, you know, standard in all the treks, pulled up, planted, crushed the leaves, and indeed they did look like bloody flesh, and the so-called blood ran all over his hands. I have a certain connection with the Popo Vu. So when I got back, I ran to the New York Botanical Garden and asked if anyone knew such a plant, and nobody did. A little more research, and the plant was found. It's Tectona grandis, plain old teak, the baby version, which is an Asian native. Teak wasn't brought to Central America until 1913. Is it possible that this story from the Popo Vuh was mixed into the Maya epic by a visitor from Asia? And I have only one more topic, and that's Boats and Oceans Asian Edition. There are currents in the Pacific Ocean as in the Atlantic, and one goes conveniently from the west coast of Mexico right up to the East China Sea. It was in the first century of the Common Era during the Han Dynasty that the rudder was invented and used to steer Chinese junks, which were the most seaworthy boats in the world for hundreds of years. This fits very nicely with a possible contact between the Han and the Nairat, by the way. And here we have one of these formidable junks. Torhayodol sailed from Peru to the Tuamoto Islands on a balsa wood raft. Balsa is the lightest of all woods, but it comes with a price. The wood will eventually become saturated and the raft will sink, and that just about happened to him. The Chinese had a neat trick to get around this. You cut the head off a goat that you don't like and scoop out the insides and you blow air into the cavity because the ribs you get air in anyway and seal up the neck. Then you stick this bladder or a few of them under the boat. This is Thor Heyerdahl's boat. And you will have one of them. Have buoyancy with practically any wood except lignum vitae, which sinks. And that's my talk. Any comments? Yeah, Jane, um, Yvonne would like to speak. She is uh, talking about some theories she's read about um, regarding um, inter interconnection between some of these places. So I'm gonna unmute her and give her a chance or invite her to unmute, I guess is the way I have to do it. There we go. And hopefully Yvonne, you've got um, an invitation to unmute. Okay, there, can you hear me? Yes, yes. thank you. Okay, I had a few issues there for a second. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was listening to a podcast a couple of years ago, they were discussing how 
they've made a genetic connection between the monkeys in South America and monkeys in Western Africa, mm -hmm. um, showing, and the, the, the prevalent theory is that a chunk of land broke off from Africa, floated across a probably smaller Atlantic Ocean. And um, it's, they think that it's kind of settled in the Caribbean, probably north of, I think, Venezuela. And they found, they've made a, the lizards that are on this little island, they've made a genetic connection between those lizards and lizards in Western Africa. So they think that's how the monkeys came across. So if monkeys did it by accident on a piece of land that broke off, then sure, why couldn't humans do it before, pre, in pre-Columbian, well, before the New World was discovered? Yeah, that's really interesting. Actually, New World and the Old World monkeys have a, have a distinct division. I forget which one is which, but one side has a prehensile tail, they can hang from the trees and all that, and the other one doesn't. There is um, this theory that uh, the animals came over on mats of vegetation, like the sargassum weed or something like that. And of course, that's really very possible. Yeah, I know that they said they had to go back. They had to do some archaeological digs to actually find a monkey that was old enough to carry that genetic connection. So I'm sure over the centuries, they of the South American monkeys evolved separately from what the monkeys in Africa yeah, and also when it comes to people, uh, I was uh, doing some diving on the uh, on out of the islands around Honduras at one point, and of course there are an awful lot of black people there, and they're I don't know descendants of escaped slaves or people who came when they when they finally got their freedom or something. Anyhow, they they speak some form of English which I couldn't understand at all until I got the master key, key. That was the one word that the boat people use. It's half their vocabulary. And when I, dis when I finally distinguished this one word and realized that all ofs become oos and all participle, present participles become mm, I realized what that word was and I could translate everything. But these are recent, um, uh, recent immigrants. Yeah. Yeah. I know recently, I'm not sure how much I believe this because it's, I don't think it's a accepted theory. Yeah. I saw a video about there's a researcher in, in I think it's in, yeah, in the Amazon, and um, where he says that he thinks some people from Spain wrote, like, came across the Atlantic and sailed into the Amazon River basin and just kept sailing up the Amazon until they couldn't sail anymore and just settled there. I would believe it. Do you know who the guy was? I'd like to look him up. I don't know off the top of my head. It was just a random video that YouTube recommended to me. Okay, thank you. And that was a couple of months ago. Wow, recent too, that's good. I'm glad there's more interest now. When I was a kid, um, you know, nobody said, nobody thought there was wide trade routes and slowly we're just coming around from that. It was really nice to see a big exhibit at the Met on the extent of trade and the other hemisphere. You know, if that exhibit's still at the Met? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch that. Do you know if that exhibit is still at the Met? No, no, it was a temporary. Oh, okay. I live in New York City, so it's going to the best. Lucky lady. Yes. <laughs> you know, I find it interesting because this it, it just came up again as you guys were chatting, and then you had started off earlier with language sharing too, um, Jane. Uh, yeah. Both times. I always think of, uh, like, just even here in the States, we have Gullah Geechee. Um, I think, are most people familiar with what that is? Uh-huh. Okay, yeah. I mean, again, it, it's all evolutionary. I I find it unusual, or to me, it does doesn't make a lot of sense that as human beings, we we tend to want to think of things happening in a very linear 
an organized way. And I think, <laughs> I think all of the evidence suggests that, no, it, things don't happen that way at all. More, <laughs> it's more of a contagion than it is an evolution. At least that's the story of my life. It, well, exactly. I mean, how many of us, as we develop, because I was, again, you, you've had a very interesting life. And how many of us, as we're going along our, our life, some people, I'm sure, are following a very linear map that they have in their mind. But I know there are a lot of us who I don't I don't know the reasons why. And it could be attitude. It could be just reality and experience. But, uh, yeah, we tend to evolve based on um, how life shapes us and, that, and the ways in which we connect with life. So it, it's a, a mutual and interactive thing as opposed to a linear map. Yes, I agree with you 100%. Is there anybody else or are we done? No, I put out an invitation on the chat, but maybe uh, as, as we're talking, maybe there's people out there that might want to either ask to be unmuted or raise their hand or, oh, wait, okay. Uh, Richard Gorman is saying, everyone sounds like Kreskin. Who can say it didn't happen? It's possible that also sounds like the History Channel. According to literature from the Greeks, no one would sail out of sight of land. There is no oh, evidence no. of catamarans and other. I, I understand what he means. I get a little aggravated. Um, I, I That style that the History Channel has to fill up space by um, constantly trying to build um, anticipation or questioning, but <clears throat> I'm not sure that's what we're talking about, Richard. I think we're talking, um, that's why I use the word contagion as opposed to, granted that you might have Greek literature that says no one would sail out of sight of land, but thinking critically, I mean, do you know of any group of assembled people where there's never a person that will uh, opt for a choice out of the norm? And I think those are the people that, at least in American history, many of those we celebrate as the innovators, but undoubtedly, just as many we've never heard of because whatever they decided to do either cut them off <laughs> instantly or they failed spectacularly, but not spectacularly enough to be recorded. I don't know, yeah. would you like to engage on that, Richard? Do you want me to unmute you? I'm gonna offer him and see whether he, whoops. A rebuttal. I'm sending him an ask to unmute. I'm I'm never sure how well these things work. But, um, oh, he looks like he disappeared here. Oh no, there he is. There he is, he's unmuted. Okay, Richard, go ahead. None of the ships of the Polynesians looked anything like anything in the, the Mediterranean, the big era of Chinese shipbuilding was in the 1400s. And those boats could indeed have made it to um, the east, the west coast of the United States, and may have been responsible for the spread of smallpox, which depopulated the Indians. But this is, again, very much like the History Channel. Um, the Egyptian boats were sewn boards. Um, I'm not so sure that they could withstand any ocean voyage, let alone a voyage out of sight of land in the Mediterranean. Actually, um, there was a constant trade between um, Egypt and Crete. And that's a long voyage, and you're definitely out of sight of land. And that's been proven by the uh, uh, by the number of uh, Egyptian artifacts that are found in Crete. It really, apparently, it really is the case that these guys were were good at what they did, and they could go practically anywhere if they wanted to. They had no compass. They had no sextant. They had no clocks. Very right. Difficult to navigate. Well, they navigated um, by 
the winds, by the sun, by the stars. They would you memorize the um, you memorize the constellations. You have a pretty good idea where the North Star is. They could do it. Yeah, if if you're in an ancient civilization and you don't have to, um, you don't have all kinds of things or distractions occupying your time. Why wouldn't you just naturally experiment with what you have? And there's always going to be a bell curve of people's um, daring and interest and um, whatever. So it, I, I think it's impossible to, I mean, all we can do is apply what we know of human nature, but it's impossible to say no one would have done that or everyone would have done that. Um, I, I don't think that anybody in a group like this is assuming that any of this speculation is fact, mm -hmm. but... Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the danger to me of the History Channel. There's a lot of people that watch it and then we'll try to quote it, you know, in, in a, another group I belong to. And we'll try to quote it um, as gospel. And again, knowing what their programs are like, I understand what Richard is saying. You, it, It's theorizing. It, it's speculating. It, it's what human beings do. We imagine possibilities, but it doesn't mean it happened. And it also doesn't mean it didn't happen. And um, if, uh, are we okay with, Beverly wants to speak again too. I'm going to uh, unmute her if I can figure out how to do this. Let's see, Beverly, there she is. Did you get the invite, Beth? No, it's saying, no. Yeah, you've got it, you're open. Okay. So I can be heard. Yes, you I can. Am, I, okay. So it may not have been a direct route. I'm going back to the Phoenicians and they set up um, like trading stations uh, in, uh, one was in Sicily and another uh, was in a part, I'm blanking on where it was. But what I'm saying essentially is that if, uh, for example, Nubians were taken uh, and they were used uh, uh, and they were as slaves, um, it's possible that they were living in places that were not home to them. And that future sailors, um, as sextant was discovered, et cetera, uh, would take um, captives or slaves and have traveled with them, although I'm not necessarily speaking of the Omex, because mm -hmm. it is, um, you know, you wonder how could people in wooden boats uh, travel uh, waterways and in, in, in great distances and without a compass and a sextant, albeit the stars were a great navigational tool and end up in Central America from, um, from the area of Egypt. So it might, what I'm, I guess the bottom line is it didn't, I don't think that we're talking about maybe necessarily a direct Route. Well, I wasn't going to play this song from Harbo and Samuelson, but because of this, they rode, R-O-W-E-D, uh, to France from, I think it was Boston, I'm not sure, but the song is very interesting, and I'll play it, a little bit of it anyway.
We're not hearing you, Jane. We're not hearing any sound. Oh. I'm not sure why. Did... We're seeing a picture, but we're not seeing any sound. Oh. We're not see having any volume. Okay, well, never mind that then. It won't. If it won't, it won't. Yeah, that often happens because yeah. um, it's happened with Zach. Yes, uh -huh. that's true. Yes. To share music and you just don't hear it. Oh, what a shame. It's on YouTube if you want to look up Harbro and, and Samuelson. Yeah. It's a great song, by the way. I know there's a way to do it because uh, Robert Kellerman does it oftentimes, but I don't know. He's kind of a master at these things, so I don't really know for sure how he does it. I've never had trouble, but I. it was always if I had music to play, it was always the first thing I played. Ah, okay. I'm I, again. I can't offer any technical assistance. Um, Yvonne had uh, mentioned. Um, I, I don't know. I invited her to be unmuted. If, I'm not sure if she did. But I'm here. Um, oh yeah, there you are. Okay. So, do you want to talk about what you were talking about, the Vikings? Sure. So, I mean, going back to the theory that people wouldn't sail outside of land, well, the Vikings we know that they settled in what's now Canada, and just by island hobby. They settled on Iceland. That was nobody could see that from any landmass. So obviously people did cross water without knowing what was on the other side. And they made their way to Scotland as well. Yeah. The Vikings. Yeah, I think it's it it's uh kind of hubristic to assume that people would not have done things that would not have seemed likely to us, but that doesn't mean, again, all you have to do is really look around and see the number of people and the choice and the different choices they make. And in any group, there's always somebody that at least 10 people are saying, oh, that person's crazy. But that doesn't mean they, they didn't do the same thing, you know, thousands of years ago. Yeah. Yeah. It, and it, it's, to be honest with you, it seems more likely that a lot of things are done by trial and error or simply by fortunate accident. And as I said, you just wouldn't hear about the ones that didn't work out. Yeah. You know? I, I do know, I mean, again, as we earlier on when you were talking about different voyages, I know there are certain groups that seem to believe or insist they believe that Jesus actually came to America. Um, I don't have an opinion either way, but it's interesting, you know, uh, apparently they cite certain kind of evidence. I think if I remember correctly, they, th there's a tendency to believe uh, he was somewhere in the Southeastern United States or North American continent. But, um, you know, I mean, as and long as you, what's that? He would have had to get back too. Well, yeah. Um, let's see. Joel saying he came on Tuesday, I recall. <laughs> I'm not sure how serious. Joel, do you want to talk um, about this theory? Because I only vaguely am aware of it, but uh, I know it's been around for as far as long back as I can remember. I'm going to invite Joel to unmute and see if he has anything to offer on this. There he is. So let's see if he. Uh, so, yeah, I'm very familiar with this because uh, he came on a Tuesday and uh, he had to catch his flight back on the following Thursday. So he only came for a short time. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a well-known, established historical fact that is indisputable. <laughs> I thought maybe you, uh, because do, are you familiar uh, with what I'm talking about? That there are certain, I don't know if they're religious groups or subgroups or whatever, but are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Yes, it's called the Book of the Mormon. Oh, okay. all right. I I had a feeling, but I wasn't positive. So I don't like to cite things I'm not sure about. Good um, for you. <laughs> but uh, that is a, a, an official part of their belief. Is, is that what you're saying, Richard? Yes. Excellent. Interesting. Now, do you know anything further about, um, do they have any other items fleshing this out or offered as evidence? Well, the religion started when they found the magical gold plates left by the angel Moroni. Oh, right. The guy in upstate New York. 
the guy in upstate New York, right? Joe, yes, uh, that's where it yeah. started. It's so it's supposedly in that book of of Maroney. In the Mormons book, uh, I guess they called the book of Maroney. That's yes, a, I believe it's an angel, right? He was an angel, Maroney. Yes, and 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 don't forget that Joseph Smith, who found the gold plates, used a magic hat to transmit translate the plates as he was illiterate. Oh no. It, th this isn't where the tinfoil hat thing started, is it? <laughs> I don't know. It was a regular hat. I'm so, I'm sorry. I shouldn't laugh, but it it does. I mean, even I'm the one saying that you can't rule out possibilities, but I will confess that there are certain ones that seem more possible to me than others. <laughs> that That's, could just be my narrow mindedness. Has anyone else in this panel read the books? 1491 and 1493 by Charles C. Mann. I have not. I don't know about anyone else. Anybody want to raise their hand or drop a note in the chat? You want to tell us about them? I don't see anybody. Well, 1491 was his first book, which won a Pulitzer Prize in the early aughts of the century. And it was about all of the civilizations in the New World. Oh. He also quotes things that people are saying that there may have been 100 million people living in Central America before the Spanish came. I have heard that, yes. I have heard that. And, and he <laughs> also quotes... Uh, the first Spanish conquistador who sailed down the Amazon from Peru to the Atlantic. And they mention finding villages every mile along the way for thousands of miles, each village of which had hundreds of inhabitants. And he offers some evidence, like Kreskin does, that um, the transmission of smallpox and measles and typhoid from those explorers were the reason that 50 years later, there weren't anybody in the Amazon basin. Yeah, that, that I think um, uh, that theory is pretty widely spread for all different um, New World civilizations. I think that it was contact with European civilizations that we know of, at least, um, that be, that began those epidemics. Another, and it also worked the other way around. Syphilis, I have read, actually was carried from the New World to the Old World by um, early sailors and explorers. Actually, I have a, a couple of things to say about that. First, as an example of changing thoughts with more information, um, I remember sitting on top of a, a uh, Maya pyramid with one of the guys who worked there, and he was pointing out lumps in the in the uh, never-ending jungle that stretched out, and he said every one of those lumps is a pyramid and a temple, and nobody really believed that. They thought, well, the Maya had civilization and they had these roads that the roads had a definite beginning and an end and that was it. Um, now that somebody thought uh, to fly some planes over with LIDAR and look and the guy was absolutely right and in the, the length of a heartbeat the estimates of Maya civilization went um, from hundreds of thousands to more than millions. Right. Now the other thing is that the, what I read, and this is, I mean, it's so political that you can't trust anything you read. But what I read was that the traders often deliberately um, took blankets from people who had uh, smallpox and gave them to the Indians. That was the British. That was the British? Yeah, in the, in the 18th Jackson. century. And Andrew Jackson with the Trail of Tears as well. Yeah. Um, in fact, Squanto, who met the, the pilgrims, 
had been the only survivor of his tribe and had in fact been to England and back by the that's pilgrims. right yeah I forgot that the pilgrims yeah I forgot that thank you uh, thank before you. we move on too far Richard um I'm trying to put a note in the chat uh, you the book the titles of those two books were 1491 and 1493 yes and who was the author again Charles C Mann M-A-N-N Charles C M-A-N-N -N, in case anybody wants to follow up with that thank you and 1493 is the story of how the horticulture from the people in Central and South America spread all over the world. If, after the conquest of the Incas and Magellan's successful voyage, um, the Spaniards set up Manila in the Philippines as a trading post where they would bring the Inca gold and silver to trade with Chinese um, um, traders, and then the, the silver and gold would go to China. In addition, Mann says that by 1550, Chile's, which came from Central America, were an established part of the diet in China, as is baby corn. Oh, yeah, like... Um so South American food spread all over the world. Szechuan cuisine. Years. Yeah, Szechuan cuisine. Um, yeah, I, I live uh, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and we have a very um, established um, kind of historical culture. We're one of the oldest cities in the in the United States. This year's our 400th anniversary. But one of the projects within um, this designated historical area has actually been the cultivation of uh, seeds that have been passed down through native families. This was quite a project, apparently, you know, uh, putting the word out and asking people to um, contribute things they thought might apply. And, you know, scientists had to weigh in on it and that sort of thing. So um, that's an interesting project too, uh, connected with what you were just talking about. So you made me think of that. Um, yes. Uh, and in fact, it was Native American um, seeds and plantings that not only helped the original colonists survive the, the first few years, but um, also tobacco, right? That was the source of the tobacco craze that lit up Europe. No pun intended. <laughs> I think that the initial cultivators of, of tobacco in this country were the Native Americans. Don't forget there are vast mound cities all over the Midwest and the South that were built by Indian tribes that were very prosperous until the white man came. Yes, yes. And, and those mounds may yet be proven to be an extension of the uh, uh, Mexican Central American peoples. Yeah, I think as, as um, near as Ohio, I think near to the East Coast as Ohio. I don't yes. know that there are any in the what is considered the Atlantic coast, but in but, Georgia, what is it? There is, there, there was one in Georgia, Georgia. Okay. Well, that was, yeah. Cherokee land. Yeah. Oh, huh, interesting. And there's another one by Charleston. Oh, okay. I see again, I don't spend as much, I haven't spent as much time in the South, but uh, interesting, but these have not been ex excavated to your knowledge. Uh, no. One of the ones in Georgia was on a farmer's land, and by use of several teams of horses and drag plows, he managed to eliminate it in a year and a half. Hmm. Oh. Did he find any archaeological things? Of he interest? wasn't interested. He didn't care. He wanted flat land that he could farm. It's <laughs> horrible. But when I visited... New Mexico, the, the tour guide at one of the uh, state parks said that the population of northern New Mexico before the, 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 the drought in the year 1200 
exceeded 30,000. Well, certainly when the original colonists landed in um, New England, I mean, there was ample evidence of Indian villages throughout what is now New England. So, but, and it, I think in later years, they finally reconstructed, you know, the plagues that, and the course of the plagues that wiped them all out. But, you know, they had this fantasy that there were no try. There were, in fact, a few left here and there, but they had basically retreated deeply into um, further inland and, and they kind of made themselves invisible, not wanting to have further contact initially. But you're right, Squanto uh, had been in um, Great Britain, I think. And when he returned, his entire village and all the people were wiped out. In fact, they some places they a lot of uh, they found skeletons just scattered around uh, the areas where it was clear that villages had existed. So they there was nobody even to, you know, tend to the dead. But uh, yeah, oh yeah, that's the other thing I was going to say is. Uh, that was something too. Um, the cash they did find, the early settlers did find um, burial caches that contained things like corn and seeds and other things. And they, again, they kept an accounting um, of what they took because they intended to return it, which I thought was kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, so the Indians who did still live he here um, were aware of the colonists, but the colonists weren't necessarily aware of the natives in the beginning at least. Okay, well, if that's um, all, I think I will have to depart at this point and thank you very much for listening. And Patty, thank you so much for, um, for doing the hosting. Oh, well, thank you, Jane. It's always nice to hear your presentations. You have some interesting topics, so thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Blessings all, have a good afternoon. You too. I don't know for sure how to shut this off completely. I just have a leave button. Do you know how to shut shut us out? I don't know if Zach. Uh, well, all I have to do is uh, just that should do it. Okay. Um, yeah, it says we still have five people, so I don't know how to close out the session. And I don't see. I don't know if Zach's still here. Is he? Hold on. Probably not. No, he's not. It's just uh, you, me, Richard, and Joel. So I'm going to hit. Uh, Joel is saying, are you the host? I thought I saw the thing flash, Jane, that said you were the host because Zach's not with us anymore. On the lower right-hand corner of the screen, it says leave. Right, but we don't know how to close. The, we're trying to figure out for sure how to close the session entirely. Doesn't that do it? Well, that's for individual participants. Oh. I don't have so it. <laughs> I don't know if it's shut. Yeah, you. the last I knew, Jane, you were the assigned host. Oh, I have it here. 